I would like to begin by welcoming, welcoming, welcoming everybody to the Raising Peace Festival for 2024. Uh, my name is James Cox. I'm one of the organisers of Raising Peace. I can see there are a few other key people and uh, and uh, Wish Sharinga is uh, doing the background work, bringing you all, all in at the moment. Um, as many of you will know, Raising Peace has been running these online festivals for the last four years. Um, we're a, co we're a coalition of peace-minded organisations and individuals um, where many of us are based in Sydney, but the organisation has grown in, in reach um, through each year as we've gone along. So um, thank you all for being supporters this year and in the past. Raising Peace is about the idea that building peace requires work. Peace isn't just something that happens. Whether you're cultivating peace within yourself whether you're pursuing the technical disciplines of peacemaking, peacekeeping, or peace building, or you're working to stand against the seeming desire that some have to lead us to war, peace doesn't just happen. So raising peace works for peace by raising the profile of peace in all its forms, by celebrating those who lead the way, uh, people like David who we're hearing, hearing from today, and by inspiring you all to act. So it's in that spirit that I um, am going to begin today by acknowledging that I'm talking to you on land that was taken from its original inhabitants, the Wongal and Gagal people of the Eora nations. Their lands were stolen, their populations were dispersed and killed through violence and disease, and their place names erased. <clears throat> Nonetheless, we celebrate the fact that they and their stories do survive and recognize that raising peace in Australia demands that we strive for peace and reconciliation between First Nations and settler people. We acknowledge the leadership of elders past and present and look forward to a time when they are respected and celebrated by all Australians. So today, um, we welcome Senator David Shoebridge, who is a long-standing champion of peace and a friend of Raising Peace. Um, David, as you know, is a Green Senator for New South Wales, which is merely the, the uh, latest in a long and successful political career and he's the Australian Greens spokesperson on justice, digital rights, defence and veterans and migration. Uh, David's been a passionate champion of environmental, First Nations, justice and human rights issues for decades, and not only in his political career. So I'd like to welcome you, David, um, to this talk today and thank you for, um, for taking the time. Um, Today on this third anniversary of August, David is going to update us on what's happening with the initiative, what we know and what we don't, and what an alternative might look like um, and what we can do. Uh, we'll be going until uh, until four o'clock, and then right after four, there is another Raising Peace section, which we'll tell you about towards the end. Um, and uh, you'll be able to, to uh, move across to that if you would like to. Um, so first of all, welcome, David, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, yep, that that's my pleasure, and um, and James and we and all of you at the Raising Peace Crew, I'm in, incredibly grateful for the work you do because, as as you correctly point out, you know um, there's plenty of people working for war and weapons, um, and if we want peace, we absolutely need to come together and work for peace. So the Raising Peace doing this, I think, is really critically important. And I, I too want to acknowledge that um, I'm on First Nations land. I'm speaking to you from Gadigal land. And, and I want to pay my respects to First Nations peoples. And uh, if we're thinking about the region, um, we think about where conflict has happened in the last few centuries. A lot of that conflict has been with um, external forces um, against Indigenous peoples and not least on this, this continent. So um, let's acknowledge that First Nations justice is also part of peace. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks thanks for the invitation, James. Mm. So it's a bit of a big subject, you know, what is all <laughs> it as it's going, what's the alternative? Um, we've got an hour, we should get that all sorted. Yeah, yeah, well, let's go. So um, David's going to talk, I will ask a few questions along the way, and there is going to be time for you to ask some questions um, at the end from the audience. So you can write in the chat, um, you can put up your hands a bit later on. Uh, but I think we'll we, we'll have those questions at the, at the end after David has spoken for you know, more or less the first half of the of the hour. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, David, first question: What is AUKUS, and why do we have it? Just the the simple yeah. basics first. Well, I mean, it, it's an acronym, isn't it? 
Australia, the UK and the US. It's a trilateral agreement and increasingly a series of agreements between Australia, the UK and the US, which is designed at least at a rhetorical level um, and, and also, you know, to a substantial extent at a structural level to tie the three economies together, um, integrate our industrial base and particularly our our capacity to make um, military hardware, um, uh, to, to remove barriers for the flow of information and technology and weapons between the three nations, um, to facilitate Australia getting nuclear powered submarines, which will be part of a kind of combined military um, um, stance, particularly in, in, in our region. Um, and uh, and it's, it is a political, a foreign affairs and a defence and industry pact. It's, it's, it's designed to remove barriers and integrate the three economies, the three militaries in a way that hasn't been, um, well, hasn't been tried in Australia, at least since we were a, a, an actual um, um, fully fledged colony of the United Kingdom. It's, um, some would say it was a, a sort of short term political response from the Morrison government. I think there are deeper forces behind it, um, long standing forces in our defence, um, in our foreign affairs, and in our economy that want to integrate us um, seamlessly with the United States. Um, Yes, but it's that mixture of political, military, foreign affairs um, uh, agreement, and it's it's playing out in real time in, in front of our very eyes. Yeah, I think I, I think I've already learned something there. Like you framing it through that um, economic and industrial lens, I think is is not the usual starting point, and it, like it already you, you can you start to look at it in a different way. Um, one of the big things with, with with the AUKUS agreement is the idea of these different pillars that are part of the agreement. And we all know about the pillar one, I think, for subs, that's where we all started, but there's a lot more to it. Um, can you lay that out hmm. for us? Yeah, so, I mean, pillar one is the thing that um, kicked, kicked it all off, at least in the public's mind, um, and was the, the, the notional, you know, uh, reason to create AUKUS. Pillar one is the the nuclear submarine project. There's this thing called the um, the optimal pathway. Um, and if anyone knows anything about defence procurement, nothing in defence follows the optimal pathway in terms of procurement, but particularly projects this big. But the optimal pathway for defence is for us to acquire at least five and up to eight nuclear submarines um, between, we'll get the first one is the plan sometime about 2033. Um, that'll be our, our sort of, um, renovated uh, second-hand Virginia-class nuclear submarine, which is an attack-class submarine, um, which has been in service, that class of submarine had been in service with the United States military since the 1990s. Um, the idea is we get our first in 2033 from the United States, a, a renovated one. We then acquire two more Virginia-class submarines from the United States, also, you know, second-hand um, Virginia class submarines that will then apparently get us to a point where we will have um, through a, a joint industrial arrangement with the UK designed and built um, partly in the UK and partly in Adelaide in Australia a whole new class of nuclear submarines an AUKUS class submarine um, which will then start producing um, in Adelaide uh, from the sort of early to mid 2040s and then produce them progressively um, out of Adelaide through to the 2060s. And the idea is sometime around about 2060, we'll have between five and eight of these nuclear submarines. Probably we'll never get, even, even on the optimal pathway, it's probably not likely to exceed five because by the time we get to the 2060s, the second hand Virginia ones we got in the 2033 will, um, will be being retired. But, but that's the, that's what it's that's that's called pillar one that's that's costed at 368 billion dollars and and the reason we have a figure like that is because they kind of did a back of the envelope calculation and said oh it'll be about oh, 270 billion um but uh 
probably we better add another sort of 100 billion on on top of that because we really have no idea how much it will cost and um and initially when they were costing it they said oh don't 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 believe that 368 billion dollar figure because we don't really know what it will cost think of it as 0.15 percent of our gdp for the rest of um, your natural life um and it's probably more like that um so yeah the figure how, around, how yeah. does that how does that compare to other expenditure in, in other areas um well this this is um will end up eating about um as it sort of develops over the time between about 20 and 33 percent of our defense budget just this one particular project um 368 billion dollars it's actually hard to conceive of how much money that is. We've, we've tried different ways of conceiving of how much money it is. It's like a stack of $1 coins that reaches from here to the moon, um, which is a lot of $1 coins. Um, I think of $368 billion as you pick any two problems that can be solved with money. Now, maybe that's equity, you know, the most extraordinary public education and university system you could imagine. Um, maybe it's about... Um, radically um, investing in the most extraordinary public health system that we could possibly have. Um, you know, if any of those two problems, it's enough to solve any of those two problems over the course of um, um, AUKUS. It's, it's that amount of money. It's, it's enough money to solve kind of any two problems that can be solved by money by the Commonwealth government. Um, and so, you know, that's a, an incredibly um, impactful choice because it takes money away from whether it is, you know, gold, rolled gold, um, renewable energy system for the country, which from a Commonwealth level, you know, you could finish with $100 billion in change, um, you know, radical investment in mental and um, dental into Medicare. Again, you know, you do it with AUKUS money and then have some change. It's, it, it's, it's actually hard to conceive of how much money it is, but any two things you can fix with money, it's that sort of money. I think you may have muted yourself, James. Yeah, I've gone the wrong way. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. So, so that's pillar one. <laughs> so that's just one yeah. bit of it. Well, can um, I just maybe I'll just yeah. do, mm. do a few little quick observations on pillar one. Uh, mm. um, I've made it. You know, I've, I've told you what it is in practice, mm. um, in terms of the material outcome. What what it's designed for is not to defend Australia. It's never been intended to defend Australia. We don't need nuclear submarines to defend Australia. The whole the whole rationale behind having nuclear submarines is something that we can whack in the water um, off Perth, and we're in the process of building between a seven to eight billion dollar expanded nuclear submarine base on Garden Island, just off Fremantle um, in Western Australia. Um, the idea is that we complete that by 2027 as part of Pillar One. It will be able to host five US nuclear submarines. Notionally, some UK nuclear submarines, but none of the UK sub submarines are in the water because then none of them are fit for service because they, they can't afford to um, service their own nuclear submarines. But notionally, UK submarines, but it's actually just five US um, nuclear submarines. We're building that base for them as we speak in, um, in Fremantle, a US um, um, naval, notionally Australian, but only for US nuclear submarines um, in Garden Island. The idea being that if we then get some AUKUS submarines, we can pop a couple of them there as well. And they can travel um, into from the Malacca Straits, which is, you know, just sort of south of Singapore, all the way through the South China Sea, and just lurk off the coast of the South China Sea and track any Chinese nuclear submarines moving in the region. The idea being that then if there is a conflict, we can be part of a US force that sinks um, Chinese nuclear submarines and other naval assets in the beginning of a military conflict um, as part of a combined US military force. It's, it is, you know, so far from our shores and absolutely not about defending the maritime or continental approaches of Australia. It's entirely designed to be a small part of an expanded US military deployment of nuclear submarines in the Micah Straits and the South China Sea. Um, and it comes with a massive amount of risk. Um, even if I wanted them as a platform, the, the risk of us to Australia of not getting it, investing huge amounts of money and not getting it is, is incredible. The UK nuclear submarine is in 
industry is in meltdown. Their own audit office says that most of their projects are um, utterly unviable with the amount of money that they have. Their existing nuclear submarine fleet is almost never in the water because they can't afford to maintain it. Um, the UK sees us as a potential life raft for their failing um, nuclear submarine industry and partly the US also sees us as a life raft because they see every UK and Australian nuclear submarine that's built as one they don't have to build. But it, it is so full of risk that I think it's highly likely the UK part of it will spiral into um, um, industrial and economic chaos um, over the next um, 10 to 20 years. And in terms of getting the secondhand US Virginia class submarines, um, the US will only give them to us if the US Department of Navy and the President certify that they've got enough for their own purposes by 2033 and it won't in any way impinge upon the US, you know, the US Navy's capabilities. Um, the US Navy is already predicting to have a, a significant shortfall in nuclear submarines in the 2030s. It's called this kind of valley of... Um, um, uh, a valley of death for their um, nuclear submarine industry because in the mid to late 1990s, they had a peace dividend and they stopped producing um, a significant number of nuclear submarines. That means by the early 2030s, the US is predicted to have a very significant shortfall in the number of nuclear submarines for its own purposes. Um, in order to meet that shortfall and deal with the AUKUS, the additional AUKUS requirements, they need to be knocking out about 2.5, 2.3 to 2.5 nuclear submarines a year for the next um, for the next decade and a half. They're currently producing one, and indeed, their nuclear submarine industry is going to be put on a whole lot more pressure because they're also in the process of rolling out a whole new class of nuclear submarine. These doomsday devices called Columbia class submarines, which are huge. Um, uh, nuclear submarines designed to carry intercontinental ballistic missiles to destroy the planet with. Um, and so their industry is going to be under increased pressure. They're not anywhere producing enough nuclear submarines for their own purposes. We're likely to you know, invest billions and billions of dollars in um, this nuclear submarine venture. And we get to 2033 and whatever the president will be then, I don't know, son of Trump, nephew of Kamala, um, is almost certainly not going to sign a certificate saying they've got enough to give to us. But in the meantime, it's bleeding us dry already. We've just dropped $5 billion to the US. We've gifted it to them for their nuclear submarine capacity, industrial capacity. We've gifted another $5 billion to the UK, largely to those nice people at Rolls-Royce for their industrial capacity, because we recognize both of their industries are in, in dire need. And because this is all so far in the far off distance, we're also having to spend $5 billion expending the life of our existing Collins class submarines with some experimental engineering that many people think won't work. And that's on top of spending $5 billion not getting French submarines. So, so far we're $20 billion in the hole and we have, last time I checked, um, zero new submarines. But anyhow, that's pillar one, it's going well. Yeah, and um, from what you were saying, the the submarine bases which have been built, they're, they're, they're being constructed regardless of whether the nuclear subs get delivered that's a, a sort of a its own project with the AUKUS subs as, as a bonus yeah right? well for the for the us you know if, if we get AUKUS submarines or not they don't really care um it might be kind of useful that it, we could we, we can operate a few and and you know bear the cost of building and operating those submarines that's of some marginal benefit to the us um but either way if they're in the middle of they're in the process of getting this nuclear submarine base at Garden Island paid for by Australian taxpayers, entirely paid for by Australian taxpayers, which um, is like getting a couple of bonus nuclear submarines for them because being based at um, Fremantle, and indeed there's a history for this, there was a very large US submarine base at Garden Island, Cockburn Sound in World War II. And the reason it's based there is it's relatively rapid access to um, to the Malacca Straits and the South China Sea, and and reducing the transit time um, for you for US nuclear submarines is as good as giving you additional submarines because you have more submarines on patrol at any given time with the same fleet. So that's that's just a a um, bonus, and in many ways for the US, you know, that's reason enough for them to enter into. 
Right. Okay. Well, now let's move on, on, on to pillar two. Um, and uh, yes, see, see the other pieces of the orcus puzzle. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, pillar two, I mean, pillar one is full of risk. It may all collapse, you know. Um, we may end up just becoming an expanded base for US nuclear submarines, which is bad. It makes us a nuclear target. It feeds us into that US military conflict. It makes us, you know, a subservient part of the US, bad on its own terms. Um, but the $368 billion thing may just sort of collapse in on its own lack of logic. But Pillar 2 is uh, up and running, and it's up and running in a very, very dangerous way. And, and sometimes people get so offended by Pillar 1, and, and, and they're right to be, $368 billion on nuclear submarines we don't need and actually make us um, more at risk. Pillar 2 kind of sails under the radar. Um, pillar 2 is designed, it's that integrating of our military um, industrial base, the US military industrial base, and, the, and to the extent it's relevant, although it's quite marginal, the UK military industrial base. Um, and if you think about us integrating with the United States, if, if we were at all comparative in economic or defence um, um, size, then it might be some kind of, you know, genuine meeting of um, um, equals and an alliance. But, you know, we're a, we're a minnow and there are... Um, um, they're a white, great white shark, and uh, they, they will absolutely be dominating our industrial base. They'll absolutely be dominating the military decisions around August. They will absolutely be dominating the foreign affairs aspects of it. And and we've already legislated to remove um, to remove all of the barriers for the um, free exchange of weapons and weapons parts and weapons technology. And including related technology, and we're here talking about sort of you know cutting edge technology in, in artificial intelligence and drones and underwater you know um, 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 underwater warfare. We've we've the parliament went through a process of legislating to remove all the barriers for the free flow of that kind of weapons and weapons technology um, at the end of through the end of last year and, and the beginning of this year. That came into force um, at the beginning of September. Um, and um, and and that the outcome of that will be that we become a kind of subsidiary of these large U.S. weapons primes. You know the Lockheed Martins, the Boeing's, the um, um, uh, uh, the General Electric. These huge U.S. weapons primes, and it's intended that we produce a small part of some complex. Um, um, weapon systems. We might produce a few widgets for mi missiles. We might assemble a couple of missiles, you know, with the, the equivalent of a, an IKEA set of missile assembly instructions and a nice little Allen key that we get from, um, from Lockheed Martin. We may do, and I think it's probably, it's likely that we're going to do a lot more of what we've done with, say, the F-35 weapons, the F-35 fighter project, where there's, there's a whole suite of nations aligned with the United States who each produce parts to the F-35 fighter jet. We produce about 70 parts of this global weapon system and we feed them into a big central repository in the United States. The United States assembles them, exports them out to their friends and their allies and the US determines where those weapon systems will be used and, and we just have no say over it at all we just feed these little weapons parts into this global platform that's very much what AUKUS Pillar 2 is designed to do for the whole of our um, uh, military supply side to make us a sort of subsidiary of these large complex US weapons platforms and, and what does that mean well that means um we have almost no sovereign, independent sovereign capacity over our defence industries. We won't be making whole weapon systems here, you know, and I, I believe we should have some kind of credible sovereign defence industry that would produce weapons designed to defend Australia. Um, um, you could think that we could have some, um, um, some sovereign capacity in producing missiles and drones, above water and underwater drones to defend our continental and maritime approaches, um, We've seen in the conflict in Ukraine that those kinds of weapons get used at an incredible rate um, if, if a conflict occurs. And of course, if we don't produce any ourselves and we're entirely dependent upon these complex supply chains from the United States and whether the United States will give it to us or not, you can see how little sovereign capacity we'd have if there was an actual conflict where we needed to defend ourselves. But more fundamentally, by being part of this 
um, US supply chain, we remove any sovereign capacity about decisions about where our, our, our industry and the parts that we produce get applied, which wars they get applied to, which wars we, we end up supporting, which wars we end up um, turning a blind eye to. And if you wanted the, the, the demonstration of that, it's happening right now with this appalling conflict in, in Gaza, um, Australia has taken a, an incredibly tepid approach to it. We have consciously said through our government, through the Albanese Labor government, that we will not put in place a two-way weapons embargo. Um, we've, we have a lot of kind of deceitful statements from, the, from our foreign minister and defence minister in particular saying we don't send weapons into the conflict in Gaza. And I give you as exhibit A to, to point out what a, what a falsity that is, the F-35 weapons fighter platform. We produce about 70 parts for the F-35. Some of them, we're the only sole producer of those on the planet, not least the um, the uh, the mechanism that opens the bomb bay doors for the F-35. Um, the Israeli Defence Force has about 40 F-35s. They call them the Adir, but they're F-35 fighter jets. They are used on a daily basis to drop ordnance, um, explosives, weapons on Gaza. Inevitably, there's a degree of indiscriminate killing of um, civilians in that. Um, and we are an integral part of that supply chain. And the Australian government has refused to put any limits on, um, on those parts being used in the conflict in Gaza. The UK government is the same. They've refused to put any limits on the F-35 parts that they, they supply into the supply chain in, in the US. Um, we know that they're being used in the conflict in Gaza and that there's a reason we don't. We don't object to that because if we actually put our hand up and said well actually no we're a sovereign country um we think that there's a, a very high likelihood that these weapons parts will be used on a weapons platform to commit war crimes the icj has said um has made observations to that effect um multiple international lawyers have made observations to that effect they cannot be used um in the conflict in gaza if we said that to the united states they would say hang on I'm going to be a bit coarse here. What, what the fuck are you doing? Um, we let you be part of our global supply chain. It's our global supply chain. We will decide and continue to decide where those weapons go. We will decide where the F-35 weapons go. And if, you know, little pissant players like Australia who are part of our supply chain start trying to make independent decisions about where these things go, you're effectively determining US foreign policy and we'll never let that happen. Now, pillar two means instead of that just being one part of our defence industry, Pillar two means those kinds of observations, that stripping of sovereignty, that subservient um, relationship with the United States on defence and foreign affairs will be our entire defence industry. And it's intended to be. It's actually intended to be. And I find that incredibly frightening future. Mm. So just to, to, I think this is a pretty central sort of a, a concept. So, I mean, Australia has sold parts of various weapons for a long time, obviously. And but in like various piecemeal kind of things, and the AUKUS agreement, however, has created an agreement to, I guess, ramp this up, to uh, codify it more somewhat, and to make it much more sort of tightly integrated as as part of as part of of Australia's international relations. And in so doing, we have um, sort of ceded sovereign control over that industrial capability to to the US. Yeah, I didn't need to spend the last 15 minutes trying to explain it. You've just done it in a sentence, James, but that's absolutely right. And um, when you say more controls, actually remove pretty much any barrier. Um, mm. People can export whatever the hell they like to the United States, import whatever the hell they like from the United States. They just have to to, to send a notice notifying the um, Defence Department that that's what they're doing. No approvals, um, no requirement as to where that will then be sent onwards. Mm. So, you know, international arms trade treaty says you you need to um you need to actually have control over not just your first export but if you think it's going to go from there and be used in a potential um uh conflict where there's war crimes or um, international law is being rich you need to have control over that as well um but with orcas bill or two there's absolutely no constraint we just feed it into the united states and they send it wherever the hell they like and you know, at the moment, it's not just F-35 fighter parts. We have a munitions factory, a very substantial munitions factory, 
and I'm sorry, there's two of them. There's one in, in Queensland and there's one in Victoria. One is with Ryan Metal, a, a co-venture with Ryan Metal, a big German um, um, ethically, you know, um, uh, challenged munitions um, firm, which exports them to one, 155 millimeter artillery shells to Germany. There's another co-venture with Thales, a French multinational, um, which exports them 155 millimeter artillery shells to the United States. Um, I think the Thales one is in Victoria and the Rhine medal is in um, um, Queensland. We're already pumping out 155 millimeter artillery shells, one set which goes to, to Germany. Um, that almost certainly comes with if it's going to Germany with an export license that permits Germany to send it wherever the hell Germany wants. Germany is sending a lot of material to um, to the Israeli Defense Forces and a lot of material to Ukraine. Um, the stuff that goes to the US now just gets sent to the US without any restraints at all, pumping out 155 millimeter artillery shells into the United States. Now that could be being used just to supplement the US's um, stores of 155 millimeter shells, which have been greatly reduced because they've been sending them to Israel and Ukraine, or they could just be sent on without any notice to us to, to Ukraine or to Gaza um, and Israel. Um, again, we have no control over it. That's what Pillar 2 is designed to do. Right. So what's next? What um, don't we know or what's coming up with yeah. or, or AUKUS? Well, yeah. well we've, yeah. we've just signed a um, um, AUKUS the, 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 a fresh agreement on AUKUS, um, Richard Miles and um, Penny Wong, the Defence and Foreign Ministers respectively, went over to Washington for the Osmin talks um, last month and signed AUKUS 2.0, which is the, the formal sort of trilateral um, second stage of the agreement. Um, that, that was pretty enlightening because um, that was really, again, largely focused on Pillar 1, but it has some elements of Pillar 2 in it. So it was largely focused on the nuclear submarines. Um, and and that, that agreement shows what, a, what an unequal relationship we have in, in AUKUS. Um, it says the US and the UK can supply to us the technology and the parts for nuclear submarines. Um, and there's provisions in there for us to pay them for that, um, for the provision of those parts. Interestingly, there's not a single provision in AUKUS 2.0 agreement for them to pay us anything. There's, there's no, it's never ever contemplated that they pay us anything, even though we're providing a big chunk of the industrial uplift, we're doing apparently some of the design work for the AUKUS submarines, when we're providing you know, at least one um, um, uh, nuclear submarine base for the United States, there's no, no contemplation they'd ever pay us anything for any of that. Um, it says that the UK and the US or Australia can terminate it at 12 months notice, which I think is troubling in terms of, um, for a reason that I'm going to explain in terms of what the cost will be to Australia, but, but also promising because it shows it can be terminated and it's conceived that it could be terminated. But it also says if, if at any point the US or the UK cancel it, that we have to give everything back. We have to give back all the parts, all the technology, if we've, if we've had some, if we've purchased some second-class submarines, have to give them all back. And um, if, you know, we've already dropped billions of dollars in their industries, we've spent billions of dollars doing stuff, and guess how much money we get back if we have to give all the stuff back? Um, if you no guess what? more dollars, you're correct. We have zero refunds for it. And um, so, so at any point they can terminate it on 12 months' notice, we give all the stuff back. and, um, and they It's a very it. expensive loan. It's um, I think it's so reckless. I mean, it's uh, the US and the UK have crafted an agreement that looks after their national interests, right? They 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 want the capacity if 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 it's not suiting them mm. to terminate the AUKUS agreement um, for whatever reason, um, and and they've got provisions in there that says if they terminate it, their interests are served. All the stuff is returned, as you would imagine, mm. but. There were meant to be Australian officials sitting on the other side of that negotiation, right? And you would have thought that an Australian official would say, well, actually, if we're giving you all that stuff back that we've paid for, you have to give us all the money back that we paid for it. I mean, you would expect that kind of arrangement if you were negotiating the sale of a toaster or borrowing a car from a friend. Mm. Um, um, but no, there's, there's 
I don't know what the Australian officials were doing on the other side. And when we test this with the likes of the Australian Submarine Agency, which is the defence agency inside defence, we say, well, you know, what the hell's going on here? They just say, oh, no, they're our friends. Um, they'll look after us. They're our friends. Well, in my experience, nations, they, they kind of don't really have friends as such. We have at different point interests. That's how the UK and the US have approached this. We're a kind of interest. We're giving them a bunch of money and providing them some free bases and doing all that stuff, which is in their interests. And um, in return, we just sort of roll over and have our bellies tickle. It's incredibly one-sided and it shows kind of what a um, mendicant relationship, the likes of Richard Miles and Anthony Albanese and Peter Dutton and and Andrew Hastie, the kind of decision makers in this space have in our relationship, it's genuinely embarrassing. Mm. Yeah, wow. Um, so I think that's a, a nice moment to sort of shift perhaps to, to a more hopeful note and uh, I guess to explore what, what what an alternative might look like for a, you know for Australia and for our region to be peaceful and secure and how we might work towards that. Hmm. Well, I mean... <laughs> I think I said at the beginning, AUKUS is not designed to defend Australia. This is all designed for us to project force thousands and thousands of kilometres from our shores to threaten China largely. Um, and if you read the um, Defence Strategic Review, which was done last year, it is meant to underpin all our strategic thinking. The, um, the, the task that we've given in that Defence Strategic Review to our defence forces is... Yeah, it's to defend Australia, sure. That's one of the tasks. And to defend our maritime and air approaches, yep, that's one of the tasks. But it also says, oh, look, Australia is a, a nation that engages in global maritime trade across the planet. And um, that global maritime trade could be threatened at any point by an adversary. And we need to be able to respond to those threats anywhere on the planet to our global maritime trade and to do that, we need to be able to project force with our partners to defend our global maritime trade wherever it is threatened. Mm. Um, and there's kind of, you know, coded references to China in the course of all of that. Um, that task that it's given to Australia is this absolutely ridiculously supersized task for a middle-sized power that's in the sort of the sort of arse end of the um, Asia-Pacific region. Um, a very nice part of it, don't get me wrong. Um, um, it's an impossible task for us to do with our defence. And it's obviously only designed for us to be a small part of global projection of force by the US military. Some people say that makes us safe. Um, I, I don't think it even comes close to making us safe. What it means is we're putting our hand up to invite ourselves to the next war that the United States wants to have. Well, pre we've, we've invited ourselves to every one of their wars, So, but particularly the next war in the region. And that could be a catastrophic conflict, which... Some in the United States are thinking should happen sooner rather than later with China. Um, and, and that would be devastating for our region. It would be devastating for Australia. It would absolutely be devastating for the United States and China. And, and we are actively encouraging that and actively egging that on with our participation in AUKUS and our, you know, feeding our industrial power and our, our wealth into this conflict. Um, there are countries in our region much, much closer to China that don't feel it necessary to buddy up to the United States to protect themselves from China. Think of Indonesia. It's a very large country in a huge archipelago that's actually between us and China. Um, and it feels quite uh, militarily secure from China. It does, it's not building up a huge naval fleet or a huge fleet to defend itself from China because it doesn't see China as a realistic threat of projecting force into the Indonesian archipelago. Um, you would say the same with a bunch of countries in our region. They're not partnering up to the United States as a kind of way of, you know, muscling up to defend themselves from China. There are some countries in the region, South Korea and Japan, that have defence arrangements with the United States, and that's their approach. But there's a bunch of other countries in the region that do not have that approach, and they actually don't want to see a, a narrative or a development of inevitable conflict with China because they don't see it happening. That being said, China is not a, a benign... Part, uh, um, player in the region. China has its own interests. Mm. Um, it's got its economic interests. It's got a lot of historical um, 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 thought that it brings to, to the table because of its humiliation last century and the century before, and it wants to ensure that it can defend itself from that. It's behaving, I, would, I think we could all agree, aggressively and unethically in the South China Sea in conflicts it's having with Vietnam and the Philippines and others. 
Um, all of that's problematic, right? Mm. Um, but I stress there's a bunch of countries in the region that don't feel like they need to escalate this into a kind of narrative of inevitable military conflict with China. They, they're not they're not threatened um, with their sovereignty. Um, they want to engage with it on a sort of more collective de-escalation response rather than a, a sort of alliance-based gathering of two forces for an inevitable conflict. And I'd much rather we joined on that um, on, on that strategy. And in the meantime, concentrate on a defence force that is focused on defending Australia, which would be A, good for defending Australia, B, would come at a fraction of the cost of the kind of AUKUS circus, um, and C, would lead to be part of a kind of de-escalating um, in the region. That's a far more hopeful, cost-effective um, um, and confidence-building approach that I'd like to see Australia undertake. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, painting painting that, that picture of, of a... a uh... And, and, and we need to flesh, flesh that idea out a lot more than we have time for now, I think, to actually really explore what that, that looks like. Um, it would be well worth us spending some time on in the future. Yeah. Well, um, it, it, indeed. And if you look at some of the kind, there's a bunch of people thinking in this space, um, mm. quite a number of people thinking about actually our strategic relationship with Indonesia is probably in the long term, perhaps one of our most important military defense foreign affairs strategic relationships in the region yeah. for a whole bunch of reasons and 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 meanwhile what are we spending our time doing we're spending our time uh developing a strategic relationship with the united kingdom <laughs> hard to explain really it is hard to explain um i think it's it's we should move on to some of the questions that we've had from the the participants in the room um and uh, the first one uh, from Lois Van, uh, Van Jelovin, perhaps. Um, I, I think we've addressed somewhat in, in terms of the um, the various submarine bases around it and the fact that they are somewhat independent from, from August itself, that it's happening anyway. I um, don't know if there's more to say on that. Well, I mean, there, there's probably just a little bit more to say. This The, the whole rationale for us building it at mm -hmm. Australian taxpayers' expense in Garden Island is because at some point it may be used for Australian AUKUS submarines. I think as the Australian public might actually be really offended mm -hmm. by spending $7 to $8 billion simply to build a US nuclear submarine base off Perth. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very likely what we're doing, right? Because... Yeah, there's just huge uncertainty about us getting nuclear submarines. It's very likely what we're doing is right now in the course of spending seven to eight billion dollars to build a US nuclear submarine base on Garden Island off, off Perth. Um, and um, with that comes a whole lot of deeply, deeply unsettling um, um, issues. First of all, mm. if if there is a hot conflict with China and um, in that um um, escalates rapidly and, and even becomes a limited nuclear exchange. Um, if China's thinking about where they might want to, to have a nuclear exchange, uh, a limited one that might be a way of, you know, at least on one view, potentially stopping it escalating into a full nuclear exchange, well, taking out a, a nuclear submarine base in one of the United States allies, mm. let's say maybe, well, Garden Island or Fremantle, Taking that out with a nuclear um, warhead um, would have a military purpose, and would also not be striking the US, the US mainland or, or US territory, and um, would then put the United States in China's eyes in the invidious situation of well, would they then launch a nuclear attack on China, and would they be trading Los Angeles for mm. Perth? Um, if I live is, this, is, is this is this going is this thinking going to be out um outdated, David? There's a question from Margie Beavis, Beavis asking about whether technology is going to make nuclear submarines obsolete. Um, well, I mean, I mean, the, the, what what we do know is that they they're, they're relative, even though they're much faster than a conventional submarine, mm. um, they are still relatively slow moving. They have their only natural defense is their lack of observability. They don't have other defenses. If you can find out where they are. They're a kind of relatively slow moving, fairly thin um, um, cylinder of metal, and they could be taken out with um, fairly rapidly once you know where they are. So what the, their defense is not being able to be found. Um, it's likely that particularly in the areas of operation in the South China Sea, that that area will be 
you know, if, particularly if a conflict happens, but even perhaps without that, <coughs> flooded with um, active sonar. Mm. Active sonar um, can pick up like a big void, a big metal void, like a nuclear submarine much more readily than passive sonar. Passive sonar is waiting to pick up the sounds mm -hmm. um, of, a, of, a, of a nuclear submarine. Nuclear submarines um, um, displace quite a chunk of water. They're quite big. Um, and, and active sonar is much, much more likely to pick them up, particularly if it's, you know, ubiquitously deployed by, a deponent, by an opponent across the area of conflict. Um, if that's the case and they're suddenly visible to China, um, well, yeah, they kind of become obsolete overnight. Um, that may or may not happen at the moment. They are, a, you know, a, an incredible, they're a genuine, incredibly um, real deterrent, um, particularly some of them may have nuclear weapons on them. But if they become un unobservable, well, then they lose all of that deterrence like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Joe Valentine asked a couple of questions. The first one, um, which relates to the recent the recent Osmond talks um, and the increase in the, in the number of places to which the US military has unfettered access. Um, yeah, Joe, you know, my, yeah, yeah, Joe's right to raise that. I mean, a few mm. years ago, we yeah. entered into a new status of forces agreement with the United States, which um, gave the United States military far greater access to our military bases with far less oversight. Um, by Australian military or um, civilian authorities. Mm. And so what we're seeing about to be supersized in Garden Island, and they think that uh, there'll probably be about 1,500 um, effectively permanently deployed US military at Garden Island. They're in the process of working out where to build the accommodation and the schools for them all um, um, in and around Garden Island. Um, in addition to that, there's a very substantial... US Marine deployment that's happening um, in and about Darwin, some um, pre-positioning of US Marines so that they can be sent rapidly into a conflict in the region. And there's also a quite a significant deployment of B-52 bombers, um, which are potentially nuclear capable um, in terms of capable of delivering nuclear um, weapons. They're being deployed rapidly at HMAS Tyndall. Um, and most people think that if AUKUS Pillar 1 you know, the submarine does actually get a get a run along, that almost inevitably the military is going to take over Port Kembla, um, which is just south of Wollongong on the Australian East Coast. Um, take over Port Kembla is another nuclear submarine base <coughs> for the US and the UK. And Port Kembla, you know, has has similar advantages to Garden Island in terms of a place to pre-deploy. Um, US nuclear submarines so as they can more rapidly find their way into the, the sort of the, um, the eastern part of the South China Sea. Um, so all of that is already happening. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that is, the US is increasingly seeing Australia as a, as a base, um, a source of, you know, some wealth that they can suck out of it, maybe some critical minerals, but also increasingly a military base. And one of the reasons that is happening, it's not a decision coming from strength. Um, the U.S. is requiring is is looking that a lot of its existing military bases in places like Okinawa, in um, um, in the South China Sea, are incredibly vulnerable to Chinese missile attacks, and they realise mm -hmm. most of them would be lost in the first twenty four hours of a conflict, and therefore they're looking for places that they can deploy their otherwise extremely vulnerable assets um, where they're slightly safer. And that's why we're seeing this increasing deployments in the north of Australia from the US. Um, yeah, it's already happening. I find it incredibly disturbing that we're becoming more and more a US military base. Mm. And uh, her, her second her second sort of question was uh, observing a, a recent US Navy report, which is suggesting that some of state pillar one could already be dropped. So like the, the, the like the idea of the US abandoning abandoning that part of August is already in, in the wind, as it were. Well, there's, um, you know, from a US perspective, um, what they would like Australia, South Korea and Japan to be doing um, is um, uh, engaging as part of a, a US combined operations militarily as effectively as possible from their eyes. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving my analysis. This is from a US perspective. You want your allies, if, you, if, if the US's overall plan is to contain 
and potentially militarily defeat China, which I think is incredibly dangerous and we should not be a part of, but that's what they want to do. Um, then you'd like your allies in South Korea and Japan and Australia to contribute as much money and wealth and material into that project as possible in the most efficient way possible to achieve those objectives. That's, that's what you would think if you were the US. Mm. And there's a whole bunch of people in the United States looking at AUKUS Pillar 1 and this obscene amount of money that's going into nuclear submarines with all the risks that I was telling you about. I mean, the, the, the reason I know about those risks is because they've been identified repeatedly in reports by the U UK authorities, reports by US authorities, reports by the US Navy, reports by the US Congressional Research Service. They've, they've pointed out all of these risks and they know how incredibly unlikely it is to produce it. And they also say that even if Pillar 1 does work and, and they get these few additional um, nuclear submarines, that's coming at a massive cost to the mm. Australian economy and the Australian Defence Force and is a, a, an incredible misallocation of our resources. Um, they would much rather we um, d do some other things we might actually be reasonably effective and good at um, and contribute that to the defence. And so the, um, the Congressional Research Services in the United St States um, has been leading some of the thinking on this, and they're saying, well, from the US's military and um, foreign affairs interests, Pillar 1 does not make sense. It's a huge misallocation of the Australian defence uh, resources. It's going to strip out the rest of the Australian Defence Force. It would be much better if they just um, made their role to provide these expanded bases for the US to operate in. They could spend their resources providing the bases. That's effectively like getting free submarines. Let's double down on that and, and more of that kind of partnership and junk Pillar 1. Um, that's kind of a bit awkward, though, for the Albanese government because that's kind of belling the cat and yeah. uh, saying, well, actually, our job is not to have a sovereign capacity of any sort. Our job is just to be a base, just to be a little widget in the US um, in the US military. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those particularly frustrating things that there are quite a number of really good good strategic thinkers who are in who are in 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 sort of whether it's the US military or the Australian in Department of Defence who do some good thinking, but those aren't the voices that seem to come through to when the decisions are made. Um, I mean, this this yeah. is a political fix, right? Mm. Um, yeah. This is sold in the US as oh, we've got these these you know um, our friends in the in 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 Australia who are doing some of the heavy lifting from from the Australian perspective. You know, Morrison has gone out and did it. He's now got a lucrative career within the sort of military aspects of the AUKUS industry. Miles is signing on to it. Um, mm. Albanese has signed on to it. The opposition has signed on to it. Uh, they need to try and pretend that it's um, viable, even though it's like, you know, any sort of vaguely, even hawk-based logic approach to it would say it's incredibly foolhardy. Yeah. Um, Winifred Lewis um, has asked just like the, the, the key, key question was, what can we do about it? You know, what are some of the key ways that people like us can act to change and challenge the the August agreement? Well, part um, of the reason that I engage in the kind of um, um, analysing it from a defence perspective, you know, the analysis we just did then about how ridiculous it is from a defence perspective, how what a reckless use of our defence resources it is, how it doesn't make us safe, how it makes us target, we, within their frame, right, within that that hawk frame, mm. Is because it 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 actually delegitimizes AUKUS, and it should be delegitimized because it's incredibly dangerous from an Australian sovereignty perspective. And and I think some of the good news we should take from this is that every year that it's polled, AUKUS becomes you know less and less popular. It's only you know last time I think it was tested, just just barely a third of Australians thought it was a good idea. Um, mm. It's increasingly seen as a ridiculously expensive, ridiculously risky. Um, um, surrender to the United States. And so I think collectively we should do more of what we're doing, which is pointing it out. But I also think that the, some of the critical work we should engage in is, is the thing we've just sort of skated over. Um, mm. And I'm not being critical. I mean, this was an AUKUS-based um, um, exchange. What's the alternative? How does yeah. Australia achieve um, um, safety, um, and, and, and also, how does the Australian public feel safe? Um, um, how do we engage with our neighbours in a way that doesn't feed into this, you know, global military escalation? And um, 
And I think we need to do a lot more on that and, and inspire people and give mm. people that, that alternative. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I will highlight the fact that Winifred is um, giving a webinar tomorrow evening as part of the festival on the psychology of, of, of effective altruism and effective act activism. Um, and uh, I think that's one that I think uh, yeah. will be very valuable for a lot of us to sort of understand better how we can get in that right place to do it. Um, the, the, the other piece of advertising I would like to do now is for our big event next Saturday morning, which is the, um, the No War 2024 conference, where it's, it, it's a multi, it's a multi-country event, which is happening in Australia and then Germany and then Colombia and the US, um, organized by World Beyond War which is exploring the question, the issue of US bases and US militarism and expansionism internationally. Um, and uh, we're going to be live and in person um, uh, in the city um, for that, as well as it being broadcast on, online. So I would encourage as many of you as possible to either be there in person um, or log on. Um, and you can, you can do that um, Yes, so I've got the, uh, the, the the link there to where you can register. You have to register on the World Beyond War site for that, and there are, there is a small fee associated with that. But uh, that's going to be a chance to see how what we've been talking about today connects globally over the course of, of the uh, the weekend of that event. Um, so on that note, um, Thank you very much, David. Um, that has been a really excellent and illuminating hour. And I think the way you've reframed, helped to reframe the understanding of AUKUS is much more than, about much more than, than guns and subs, so I think has been extremely valuable um, and has certainly enhanced my own understanding. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. And again, thanks to Raising Peace. Um, mm. You know, um, talking about peace, campaigning for peace, um, it, it feels more important than ever. So, uh, 